Hello, my name is Bill Lucas. I'm Professor of Learning at the University of Winchester and I'm delighted to record this short input to your event on Wednesday. I'm so sorry I can't be with you, um, but I'm up in Manchester working with all sorts of good people, including those passionate about practical learning and engineering. I just want to give you a uh, sense of how the arguments for practical learning have been developing and the kind of things which may be of interest to you as you think about STEM in the city of Portsmouth and beyond. Some while back now, nearly a decade, uh, we began to look again, look afresh, if you like, at engineering and think not so much about engineers as uh, traversing a set of subjects, maths typically in physics and, and, and many others, but to think about what it is to think like an engineer. And this model, our model of engineering habits of mind, um, has a number of different ways of approaching engineering, which help us to understand exactly that, what it is to think and act like an engineer. So aspects of thinking like systems thinking, adapting, problem finding, creative problem solving, visualizing and always improving. If you like the core engineering mindset is making things that work and then making things work even better. We were thrilled, my colleague Janet Hansen and I, when this research was signaled out, singled out by the uh, Institute of uh, Mechanical Engineers and the Royal Academy of Engineering as one of the big education ideas of the uh, last decade. I'm hoping you may be familiar with this, but if not, each of these reports in a different way uh, makes the case. Most recently, and I believe you've had sight of this, we've been looking at practical learning more generally in schools, not just in engineering, not just in design and technology type subjects, but more widely. And I want to just spend a few moments unpacking some of the thinking that we've uncovered uh, and hope that this chimes with your work together in Portsmouth. There's been a growing interest, hasn't there, in things practical, and we have a, a lot to thank the repair shop and many other uh, kinds of television programs which get beneath the item and encourage us to work out how to fix it, to mend it, to improve it, to love it, and to take care of it. What we thought, we think, if we rethought the relationship between hand, heart, and head in education. It's my belief that this relationship has become seriously out of kilter. We've been asking for too long the wrong question. We end up saying, do we want something like this, um, a rather obvious examination situation, which could also be a, an image of more didactic, didactic instruction, um, or do we want something that's typically referred to as project-based learning? And I think that's the wrong question to ask because inevitably you end up um, trying to fret about whether one or the other um, produces better examination results. And the truth is that these kind of questions allow us to get beneath that rather dull binary stereotype. Is project-based learning when done well as effective as more traditional methods in gaining examination results would be a reasonable entry level question, but perhaps at least as important would be what other benefits are conferred when project based learning takes place. And might engagement with high quality forms of practical learning actually help us to recruit engineers to um, excite young uh, people at school to take engineering or the possible uh, and a possible future of engineering uh, as a career option. When you look at what goes on in school, it's very interesting to see how simply one can fall into the very binary stereotypes that I've been referring to. You could see that traditional learning, possibly those images on the right, uh, have nothing to offer. And if you're a fan of it, that those images on the left 
potentially problem-based learning have everything to offer. Of course, it's more complex than that. It turns out that when problem-based learning is done well, unsurprisingly, young people do very well on exams. Just as it turns out that when traditional learning is done well, young people learn very effectively and uh, are able to do well at examinations. And of course, if they have a powerful relationship with the teacher as they look like they are in that top picture, then they'll be learning other things too. When we reviewed the evidence, we looked at the three main approaches, if you like the three main brands out there, project-based learning, problem-based learning, and inquiry-based learning. They're all pretty similar, and I'm not gonna go into the nuances here, uh, but you might like to look at the more detailed findings in the report. As you think about all the things that go on in school, it's very difficult sometimes to see what isn't practical. Um, even making a poem, writing a poem is a practical act. Certainly the science practical has given its name to that and field work of the kind that you can see in the middle picture there is pretty obviously practical and making music is pretty obviously practical as making stuff is in that uh, picture on the bottom there. It's possible to undertake practical learning in every subject of the school curriculum. It's not a question of some subjects being practical and others being academic. That's simply not helpful. Well, why does practical learning matter? The evidence suggests that there are lots of other things that you're learning when you're undertaking practical learning, typically in a group. And some of them are here. Uh, persistence, creative thinking, problem solving, um, and agency, as in students being more responsible for what they're doing. It builds the motivation to go on and learn more. It has a connection with our well being, so important as we come out of the pandemic and we think about more ambitious, expansive ways of not catching up in a rather dull way, but um, exciting all of our students with what's out there, what's possible. Uh, and of course, our colleagues uh, in school too. Looking forward, it seems uh, really valuable to think about the employability benefits of this kind of work too. Problem-based learning, uh, project-based learning, uh, all of these different kinds of learning combine head, heart, and hand. And you'll see that uh, in this list here, uh, there are another set of really helpful pointers as to how this kind of approach can help. I keep using this expression head, heart and hand because it seems to me the simplest way of reminding us of our whole nature as learning. I'll come back to that when I um, quote David Perkins towards the end of this very short input. Inquiry-based learning, similarly, um, has a huge history, most obviously in science, uh, and it can, of course, lead to uh, ac ac academic gain. Um, but um, you'll see there are some um, potential limitations, some potential uh, uh, caveats to be aware of here. Um, interestingly, the very teachers who are very good at this, science, science teachers, sometimes don't believe that what they're doing can also um, uh, inc increase the creativity of students too. And here, um, the third of our three different um, approaches to practical learning, perhaps less well evidenced in schools, um, but in higher education has a distinguished history uh, and uh, all sorts of different ways in which, uh, if you're, for example, training to be an engineer or a doctor, uh, it seemed to be a very helpful way of uh, preparing you for the next stage. The research that we undertook uh, was a combination of a study of literature and a deep dive in some of the schools that you'll see featured uh, on this list. It's happening, it's happening well, but it's not yet evenly distributed. And what I think you're doing in Portsmouth is terrific. And I really look forward to joining you in September to find out more about that work. Our next stage, uh, which we're just about finished with, 
is to pull out these case studies and write them up so that they'll be very useful to schools across the whole um, uh, country uh, to uh, draw inspiration from. Um, we've interviewed students, we've interviewed teachers, we've interviewed school leaders, we've interviewed experts um, from across the country. When it comes to thinking about practical learning, it is almost uh, inevitable that you have to think about how you will assess it. And in some of the work I've been doing for the organization Rethinking Assessment, we've begun to look at this. Uh, we've begun, when I, say, when, we, when I say we've begun, we've been aware of this for a while, that traditional tests, pencil and paper tests, uh, really don't cut it when it comes to getting a deeper learning of the kind that I'm sure you'll be keen to be undertaking in Portsmouth. We need extended tasks, we need sometimes performance tasks, and we need longer, deeper investigations. Most recently, I've been co-chair of the uh, Creative Thinking PISA test, which was delayed by a year because of the pandemic and has just been um, administered in schools in 66 countries across the world. And it's a test of competence. It's a test of your practical ability to be creative, sometimes in the context of science, sometimes uh, when we say social, we mean in the real world where uh, knowing your science is not the part of the test, but using your common sense is, as I implied earlier. When we're thinking about the education of engineers, we would naturally reach for problem-based learning and project-based learning as good approaches. Same is true of doctors, where much of this thinking emerged um, in North America, uh, doctors and nurses and other medical professionals. There are options right now if you're interested in project work. Obviously, at sixth form level, there's the extended project qualification, but there's also the HPQ, the higher project qualification, which you might be interested in, uh, which uh, would fit well at the level of GCSE. Certainly worth having a look at this, certainly worth, if you're interested in this, having a look at that report in the top left-hand corner of the slide. My friend and co colleague Guy Claxton has written brilliantly about this subject. If you want a, a primer, a, another source of evidence for why these kinds of things are so important, you can't separate out the body and the mind. We know now how intricately connected they are. Do have a look at this if you're interested in what I've been saying. And I close with David Perkins and his wonderful idea of making learning whole, of playing the whole game of learning. That's where I'm going in this talk. That's where we're going in our research into practical learning. We started by reconfiguring engineering as a set of engineering habits of mind. And we're now set on a mission to extend our understanding of education, to see uh, practical learning as being an integral part of what it is to make learning whole. If you've not read Making Learning Whole, then do have a look at it. It's a terrific read. So to conclude, uh, our hypothesis in reimagining practical learning in secondary schools, and of course the same uh, would apply in primary, although it's slightly easier, I think, in primary where subjects are less dominant, is, well, you can see the, the list on this slide. That if we can better understand the ubiquity and complexity of practical learning, I think this report does quite a lot of that. And if we can show some of its benefits, and if we can show that when it's done well, um, students achieve just as well as they do when they're taught in more traditional ways. And if we can distill the essence of what that looks like, that's our next case study publication, uh, then we're well on the way. You can see I've just boxed that off, the top level of that theory of change. And we're now in those bottom three areas, E, F, and G, and that's where I hope you are too. And I'm really looking forward to discussing this more with you uh, later on um, in September at Portsmouth Dockyard. Thanks so much for uh, including me in your day. I hope it goes really well. Um, goodbye from now, or even for now.